Hi, so another Mrs. H psychology video, this time paper three, addiction topic, reducing addiction, and this time specifically CBT. So I'm going to talk you through the main concepts with CBT. So the concept here is to identify the distorted thinking. So raise the idea of what the participant, the client is thinking before, during and after taking the drug or doing the addictive behavior. So to make them aware of the triggers and we call this functional analysis, and obviously this is part of the cognitive element, CBT. We also need to mention changing those maladaptive thought processes to more adaptive ones. So we call that cognitive restructuring, and that also obviously is a cognitive element. And then we've got the behavioral part, the behavioral element here is providing skills training to help them develop coping mechanisms. So very specific skills training. So I'm going to talk you through, there are actually five of them that I'm going to talk you through. So first of all, functional analysis in a bit more depth. The therapist has to help the patient to identify high risk situations that will trigger their addictive behavior. And so the focus here is on their thoughts before, during and after. And obviously the relationship has got to be supportive, not too pally. The therapist has got to challenge the client's cognitive thoughts and beliefs. We also have cognitive re restructuring. So all CBT is going to include some of this. The therapist identifies and challenges their faulty thought processes that trigger the addictive behaviors. So for example, in gambling, the false belief that they're more lucky or that they can influence the, the role of the dice, that they have more control over chance events than other people. So they, they are um, trying to challenge them on that and get them to restructure those thoughts. We also have things like drug refusal skills and assertiveness training. So it becomes very difficult to refuse addictive substances or activities, first of all, because the client is addicted and secondly, because of social pressures to continue. So the therapist will role play, really important, we mentioned role play scenarios, the client will rehearse these with them. So for example, rehearsing someone offering them a glass of wine and them being able to find ways to refuse. And with the assertiveness training, importantly as well, to learn to refuse confidently maintain good eye contact, firm refusal, things like that. We also have relapse prevention training and relaxation techniques. So relapse prevention, this is for the long term. Um, so use, use of things like the theory of planned behavior. So have a look at my separate video where the therapist talks to the patient about their beliefs, their attitudes, their motivations, and improving their self-belief that they can give up. And also relaxation techniques. It's really important that they learn to manage things like their stress, which could trigger, trigger this sort of behavior. They manage to learn um, to, to deal with that with, with more helpful techniques that they can practice to get, to get away from relaxation without, um, or to get away from this, the addictive substance using relaxation without using addictive substances instead. And this is gonna help delay the use of the addictive substance when they're facing a situation might, which could trigger its use. So maybe just that, giving them that opportunity to deal with their stress so they've got a, a breathing space, they don't automatically go into their addictive behavior or um, substance use. So let's have a look now at some of the evidence, the research going into this. So first of all, we can have a look at the Petri study with gambling. And this time it was using a sample um, of gamblers that had been recruited through media adverts. Um, they were randomly allocated. Remember, that's really important in terms of this research, randomly allocated. And if you're not sure what that means, have a look at one of my research videos on that. Random allocation to either the control group. So the control group was a Gamblers Anonymous just meetings or to the treatment group, which had the Gamblers Anonymous meetings, but also eight individual CBT sessions. Their results, group B, were gambling significantly less than group A after 12 months. Also, face-to-face -face CBT was much more effective than just using a workbook, showing the importance of this relationship between the client and the therapist. So here, we, this is really good research because it did have use of random allocation, so good methodological controls. Um, but And also, what was important was there were no significant differences in their gambling at the start. So they were randomly allocated and they all had different levels of gambling at the start. 
If we have a look at the Cheney one into relapse prevention, so 40 alcoholics, all ex-soldiers, method, they had randomized controlled trials, so all again randomly assigned to either a skills training, so a relapsed prevention group, psychotherapy group, or just a treatment without relapse prevention. And what they found was the group with the skills training, this group with the relapse prevention training, spent less days drunk and consumed less alcohol. So in other words, their alcohol consumption had really um, improved in the sense that they were using much less of it. So CBT with relapse prevention is seen as much more effective than other therapies. And if we go on to evaluate CBT as a therapy for addiction, first of all, let's talk about the problems. So problem one, really short term versus long term. So ST versus LT, short term versus long term. So often the evidence shows that this just really has a short term benefit with CBT. So Collishall reviewed 11 studies comparing CBT for gambling with control groups and results show significant benefits in reducing gambling up to three months. But unfortunately, from about nine to 12 months, there was no significant difference. There were no significant differences um, with the um, treatment group from the control group. They also believe there were serious methodological problems with the studies reviewed and many had overestimated the CBT effectiveness. Another problem is high dropout rates. So dropout rates are up to five times higher than with other therapies. Why? Well, CBT is demanding. It requires active involvement and homework activities to be practiced regularly. So obviously a lot of people are not able, do not feel able to um, stick with that and many drop out. Of those who do continue, there is also the danger of doing um, less homework later. And obviously the less practice you're doing, the less effective it's going to be. Strength, though, on the other hand, it addresses the relapse problem. For those who do stick at it, the CBT is effective in helping prevent the relapse because CBT incorporates the likelihood of relapse as part of their training. So CBT uses it as another, uh, this relapse, as another opportunity to learn about the triggers that are going to trigger off their response their addictive response, and also to use it as another um, situation to help do some more cognitive restructuring. So that is one of the strengths of it. And of course, the other thing is CBT can be tailored to the individual. So it is carried out often online and with telephone support. It's flexible to be tailored to the individual client. And it just means that it is more readily available because it can be online and with telephone support. And we also have this flexibility. But the problem is, it, because it is flexible, it, it is quite difficult to assess which bits of the CBT are most useful because we're not sure um, when it's individually tailored, which bits help um, individual, different individuals. So that's the end of the CBT video. There is one on um, treatment programs for behavioral treatment programs and also drug treatment programs.